You're tuning into the Active Mom Podcast with physical therapist, Dr. Carrie Pagliano, a real mom's guide to all things postpartum return to workouts after baby. If you're a postpartum mom, coach, trainer, or physical therapist looking for answers on how to get back to running, CrossFit, yoga, Pilates, HIIT, you name it without the fear of pelvic floor issues or doing something wrong, this is the podcast for you. Let's start the show. All right. Today we have another author um, and journalist on the podcast, and I have become such an advocate for um, these voices in the pregnancy and postpartum and just exercise space, because if they're on board, their megaphones are loud. And um, I, I, I'm super excited to have uh, author Daniel Friedman on today because her megaphone is big and loud. Um, she is the author of Let's Get Physical. Um, how Women Discovered Exercise and Reshape the World, and it's my new favorite book. Um, so thank you for being on the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right. So tell us a little bit about who you are, where you live, um, how many kids you have, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm Danielle Friedman. <laughs> I am a mom to two boys. My oldest just turned five and I also have a 10 month old. Um, I live in New York City. And I, as you mentioned, I'm the author of Let's Get Physical, which is a cultural history of women's fitness. And I am also, <clears throat> I'm a journalist. I've been uh, primarily a health and culture journalist and editor for 20 years. And um, I currently, I cover fitness and health for the New York Times well section. So you get to hit all the things. You literally get to hit like the fun stuff, pregnancy, postpartum. We've chatted a bit about that. Mm -hmm. And then your book too, where you just cover exercise and females, which I love. But you started the research for this book after your first pregnancy, right? Actually, it was Yes, yes. The the sort of time has no meaning right now in the last five years. It really doesn't. It really so. doesn't. Um, yeah, basically, I'll tell you the quick origin story, yeah. which is um, so the the idea the the seed was first planted actually when I was getting ready for my wedding, um, oh. which was about a year or so before <laughs> that first pregnancy. Um, and I, I've i always been a runner, a slow runner, as I've written about, but um, in a very stereotypical way before the wedding, I decided to check out some bar classes in my neighborhood. And um, because I was brand new to this whole kind of boutique fitness scene. I, and I'm a feminist journalist. I just, I couldn't like take my feminist health journalist hat off while I was in these classes. And I really did love how strong they made me feel. I also was struck by how like many of the moves involved these pelvic tilts and felt almost sort of sexual in a way that nobody was um, acknowledging. And so I, at first I was like, I want to look into whether, um, bar how you know whether it can impact sexual health and and pelvic floor health and that research sent me down a rabbit hole uh and i discovered that bar was created by this like fascinating really complicated woman in the late 1950s in london um named lottie burke who uh had escaped nazi persecution in germany and sure enough she was ahead of her time in terms of kind of, um, she was very open about her sexuality in class. She encouraged women to connect with their sensuality. And I wrote about her for The Cut and that was really the gateway. And so I was like, as I was researching her, I literally, I was like, oh, I'd love to speak with the person who wrote, you know, the book on the history of women's fitness. And I was very surprised to discover that book did not exist. And so, um, I also felt like I had just, it was, I had been given a gift, you know, and I found that for every, for every major movement uh, in terms of, you know, in women's fitness over the past 70 years, there was this Lottie Burke like figure yes. behind it. So that was, it, it started before my wedding and then I sold the book you know, it took me a while. I wrote the book proposal. I did, you know, researched it. And then my son, my older son was, um, was about 10 months old himself when I sold the proposal and I started the research um, right around, yeah, right around when 
COVID hit. So, <laughs> and that and that probably even and it seems like it changed even some of the trajectory of the book too because the fitness totally. industry changed completely. Now we have all this virtual online stuff, which is like flashback to Jane Fonda and like okay, mm-hmm. everything's you know virtual now. Um, yeah, yeah. It was definitely like a moving, I mean, moving target, (laughs) you know, even though um, the book is a history and I should say too, it's really also a history of beyond just like a series of fads, you know, how women's pursuit of physical strength, particularly during times when women were told that, you know, pushing themselves would make their uterus fall out, uh, how that led to other forms of, um, you know, of physical autonomy and self-determination and all of these things. And so I was writing this history, but of course, yeah, at the same time, I mean, like so much of what was true in the fall of 2019 just was kind of blown up by uh, the following fall in terms of gym, you know, gym culture and yeah. I feel like Peloton would have gone out of business had it not been for the pandemic. Like they are so lucky because I know. there was that commercial. Do you remember the holiday commercial? Uh, how could I forget? <laughs> I and it, trust me, I was like, oh my god, they're like this is right out of the 1950s playbook right? of like, yeah, shape yourself, you know, shape your figure for yeah. your man, even if you hate it. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and that's the thing that I, I found kind of as a theme as we go back because I'm at this point now, and 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 you know. 10, 10 years out from my youngest where I'm looking back and I'm like, okay, well, why aren't we any further ahead? And so when I look back in some of the stories that you shared, we all start out with this really great intention of, yes, we should be stronger. We should be doing these things. Mm-hmm. And then there's like a hard left that goes, oh, but also you can be more curvy. So you're better for your man mm-hmm. or better in bed. I'm like, wait, mm-hmm. why do we keep taking the hard left? And and like, why the patriarchy? But like, that's a bigger question. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, yeah. And I really saw clearly throughout all this history that as like women, as movement became more accepted for women and strength and muscles, there were these almost, there were these kind of like social checks that then were like, oh, okay. Yeah. You can exercise, but now the, the standard that you need to strive for is like having zero fat on your body, you know, or right. it's like now you have to have, you have to have these like sinewy, visible muscles to be considered beautiful. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's definitely discouraging when you look at it through that lens. However, I do think, I do think in the past five to 10 years, we are starting to break free from some of that. We are. It's it's funny. I, I pulled down some old diaries for my daughter who's she's in fifth grade and that's when I kind of started to write. And it's so funny what I would wrote, write. I'm like, okay, back to school. I'm going to look good, feel great. My muscles will be toned. I'm like, oh my God, that was programmed in my brain at 10. Yeah. Like, Do you remember kind of what your thoughts were as a kid about exercise? Yeah. And I will say, yeah, especially once I was like, in middle school, I, I would always have these, like every year it was like a makeover plan. <laughs> it was the yes, same no, thing. I mean, my hair is going to look great. Yeah. I'm be super cute. Like, yeah. Self-improvement was like physical improvement, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I received kind of somewhat dueling messages throughout my childhood. I'm, I'm 42. So I grew up, you know, eighties and nineties. And on one hand, I, Absolutely. As like a child of the 80s, you know, and in the book, I write about the get in shape girl toy sets, which were literally these, you know, they were they were these. It was like, so you could be like mom and wear a leotard. And, you know, it was the title, the the name of this Mattel uh, line alone, I think, speaks a lot. There was get there was great shape Barbie. So many of these, you know, messages that the purpose of exercise was to look a certain way, to be thin. And at the same time, um, both of my parents uh, were and continue to be really active and have always modeled for me taking a lot of joy in movement. Um, Mm. My dad is the the most enthusiastic runner and it's not about anything other than just, it's almost, you know, it's moving meditation for him. And he, he definitely instilled that in me as well. And my mom, yeah, some of my earliest memories of my mom are like being four years old and, and accompanying her to aerobics, sitting in the babysitting area, you know. That's and amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, 
it's all in there. And I think yeah. it, it just has, it took me a few decades of life to several decades of life to kind of shed and not that I've shed it completely, but, you know, move away from the, um, those more patriarchal or aesthetic yeah. based messages to focus on the joy. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit older. I'm 47. Um, and I think I grew up in a little more rural area. We didn't, we didn't have the, I don't remember that toy, but then again, mm, like mm. it's, it might've been a couple years off, but my mom, I remember they were active in that, like we would cut wood and mow the mm, grass and things yeah. like that, but they didn't like exercise, exercise mm-hmm, until mm-hmm. Um, I started running cross country. And mm. as a spectator and a parent, it's hard unless you can get to those spots quickly on the course. And that's mm-hmm. when they started to run. And eventually my mom started to go to, to, she was a teacher. Both my parents were, she mm-hmm. would go to the gym at school and then go to work or she would go swim before mm-hmm. or she would run. And so I look back at that and I was like, wow, you know, that was really kind of, you know, not the norm. Yeah. But I also remember you know, she would buy the rice cakes or right. you know, there was always that weight loss piece. So I feel like we're in this weird sandwich generation where we experienced that it was about how we looked mm-hmm. and weight loss and things like that. And then as we move forward for us, it's become about the joy and you got to see mm-hmm. that with your dad. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. after your wedding, like <clears throat> you're going into pregnancy, what are you thinking at this point? Is it still like, Hey, I'm going to be active and feel good. Um, like what did, what did pregnancy look like for you? Mm. Well, um, I, yeah, I've, so I've run one marathon in my life. I hope to run more. <laughs> I, um, this is also, I give bear with me on the timeline here. <laughs> I guess it's, it's all good. It, it, such a blur. It, it's all somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mentioned this. Okay. I had run the marathon, the New York city marathon about a year and a half. I think it's like, yeah about a year and a half before I became pregnant. Okay. I I really wanted to stay active through my pregnancy, my first pregnancy, because, well, for like many, many reasons, you know, I, I the joy of it, the comfort that I took in moving, I wanted to feel strong. Um, but, and I should say there's sort of, you know, as a kind of just caveat, I my feelings have evolved with every pregnancy experience that I had. And I don't know, um, I can get into, I I happen to have very complicated pregnancies. So, um, (laughs) that, that makes it more challenging for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, basically. So I, I was active through that first pregnancy and I, I ran until I developed lower back pain. And then I was like, I really want to keep moving. Um, and so then I switched, you know, I, I actually worked at the pelvic floor PT starting to probably like, five or six months into that first pregnancy. Yeah. And like I was starting to experience some diastasis and she helped me with that. And she just, you know, it was nice to feel like I was to not worry that I was, that I was doing anything that could harm myself. And I, I switched to the elliptical. Um, You know, I will say, so I, I was pretty anxious throughout that pregnancy. It just like, it was the whole experience kind of blew my mind of yeah. not being in control of my body, you know, in the way that I had my entire adult life. I was 37. And I do yep. think, yeah, I felt some some of the drive to be active was, I'll be totally honest, was out of fear that like, you know, the, I think things have improved since then, actually. But I just felt like I was taking in so much messaging around like, you know, if you do this, like you must do this or you're going to, there could yep. be a catastrophe. Especially and especially the like, first time around, because yes. you just don't know. And you're, you're, you're kind of being hit from all directions of don't do this. Don't do that. You don't want to hurt your baby. You're, you don't want to do the wrong thing. Exactly. Um, yeah, totally. And I, I mean, I remember like, yeah, I had like Chipotle once and, you know, it was the time when like Chipotle was dealing with, there had been oh, like no. a few E. coli and I, and I, I was like, I'm craving it. I'm going to have it. And then for like a week after I would be freaking out, like, did I do, you know? And so basically though, at the end of that pregnancy, I actually at at around 35 weeks, I, my blood pressure shot up and Mm. the, the, and like the diagnosis was basically preeclampsia. Um, and so, and I had, um, just based on blood alone. And so, and I ended up having to have an emergency C-section and at 35 and a half weeks and scary. 
It was. And yeah, it took me a long time to kind of recover from that whole experience. Yes. It also taught me, I will say like in subsequent with my most recent son and I, I had a loss in the middle and um, sorry. it, yeah, that's okay. It, but it, in a weird way, it was like, you know, I still think, and my sister is actually a gynecological surgeon. And so we talk about this stuff all the time. Like yeah. the being active did help me and help it yeah. help me recover. Um, but you know, the, the preeclampsia was also sort of like a reminder that like, okay, you can try to do everything by the book. And ultimately yep. for me in the future, what I, I prioritize sort of being relaxed <laughs> above everything else. And so yeah. that, that meant approaching movement a little differently too. Um, especially with my most recent pregnancy. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel like New York and DC are very similar in that respect. We have a lot of um, moms that are advanced maternal age. Mm -hmm. um, like my, my average pregnant client is probably 38. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so, and I very much felt this myself where I was like, I've been able to control everything in my life up until this point, And then all yeah. of a sudden you can't. And for me, it was the added like, oh, and this is your day job and you should be able to prevent all things, fix all things. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, well that just, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I can't even imagine. Yeah. No, but, and, and, and we had a loss in between too. Mm. So there, then there's those questions of, and it was late too. It was like 13, 14 weeks. We had started to tell people it was like, then I, you're like, yeah. And then you know what that fear is. And I was, I, I think I was more nervous with our daughter mm -hmm. because you're like, you know, you can't control this stuff, but at the same time, you just like, you know, even until she came out, I was like, what's going to mm -hmm. happen? You know, I but know, I know it's, it's so tough. How did you kind of approach the, your, your, your second son? Yeah. Yeah. And I just, um, and I'm, you know, I'm really open about all this. My, I, so our last two in the middle, I was actually, um, like 22 weeks. So it was, oh my it gosh. was really far along. Oh. Um, and, uh, I was fortunate to get pregnant very soon after that. Yeah. That us. Um, you know, yeah, I, in I a, I'm so sorry. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It was obviously, you know, one of, if not the most difficult thing we've been through, but, um, yep. but I was really fortunate to, you know, we had, um, I had really great support in every sense, you know, um, yeah. physical, mental, emotional from friends and family. And, yeah. um, and so with my second son, uh, the, the baby who's 10 months, um, in a, in a weird way, I was even more, I mean, don't get me wrong. On one hand, it was like a 10 month or a, you know, a nine month, um, it, it just, we were on egg eggshells the whole yeah. time. Um, yep. and yeah, <laughs> um, esp and especially until we got to that point for me, I mean, you know, where I had been in the previous pregnancy yeah. and, and, you know, point of viability and all of that. And, yeah. um, but, and I also was just even more like, this is kind of out of my hands. I mean, yep. and so I, I walked a lot in that pregnancy and I yep. found a lot of comfort in that. Um, I, um, I did do, I did prenatal Pilates. I did prenatal strength training with like a, you know, a program that yeah. focused on that. And I just, again, it was just like kind of moving in ways that felt good and felt right for me in between yep. the loss and that pregnancy I did train for and run a half marathon with my did dad you really oh my yeah goodness. and I just I just found for me like and I did just write a piece for the times <laughs> that I interviewed you for about pre-pregnancy fitness but I just yep. found that for me going into pregnancy feeling as strong and you know just just as strong as possible yeah um helped me if not as much mentally as anything else, you know? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was just about like I, doing whatever I had to do to be as Zen <laughs> as I could in between the moments of extreme, there's you a know, lot anxiety. To be, there's a lot to be said about that more. I think because more people are talking about loss Yeah. and what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. And and the thing is, again, 
we barely have data for pregnancy and postpartum and that kind of stuff. It, but very much after our loss, I mm. did not want to run. It did not feel, mm. mm-hmm. it, it wasn't that space. And so I, mm. I went to like a 6.30 a.m. yoga class with a bunch of 65-year-old women that was just safe and quiet mm-hmm. and ended up mm-hmm. doing that through my pregnancy. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of what we're coming up with is like, yeah, you kind of have to, depending on where you are, yes, we need to kind of build strength back and understand that, you know, you're going to have the hormone flux and, and that basic stuff. But I almost think the priority really is, you know, for you to go run a half marathon with your dad, that was probably more for your heart yes, totally. than it was, you know, to heal that, to mm-hmm. be able to move on. And I, I, I'm having more and more people asking about that. And that's mm-hmm. the answer that I'm giving, having gone mm-hmm. through that. It's like, mm-hmm. and it takes years, you know, mm-hmm. as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry for your loss too. Yeah. It's, you. all, it's so hard. It doesn't matter where you no, are. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, we're, oh my gosh, 11 years out. And I still remember the day, you yeah. know, you still remember yeah. all of that, but I'm glad that we're having these conversations and for you know, as, as bad as social media can be for a lot of different things, I do feel that's one thing that we've been able to, you know, people see how Mm -hmm. often it happens. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so now that you have two, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> how's that looking? Cause you've got one that went out the door to kindergarten. You've got mm-hmm. one going down for a nap, like, <laughs> and, and now that you know, all, all the, all, all the boutique options that are out there, like <laughs> what, what fits right now? How do you decide uh, what fits for you? Um, yeah, I always, and I will say, okay, as somebody who writes about fitness, um, obviously the book, but, but presently for the, the New York Times, I always feel a little, um, you know, I feel, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was joking, you know, I get, I get a lot of sort of PR requests to invitations, I should say, to go to classes. And I'm like, this is not like being a, a food critic, a restaurant critic, where you just show up. It's like, that would be nice, though, wouldn't it? To switch <laughs> gears for a second to be a food critic. <laughs> it would. It really would. Um, so, but, you know, I, I do think, and again, I really credit my parents with helping to cultivate this in me. But like, I, you know, I try to, I've always tried to be really kind to myself and compassionate with myself uh, as I, when I, you know, for me, fitness has been cyclical. And when I'm in a period where I'm sort of less active or, you know, um, I've continued to do Pilates and that has been amazing. I actually wrote a story about Pilates for the New York times about a year and a half ago and the premise was like, is Pilates as good as everyone says? And I had done it a little before then, but I actually had had kind of mixed experiences in the studio. And I, mm-hmm. I ended up that, that story and speaking with masters, you know, convinced me. And I found a, a local studio that um, has really been wonderful. And so that just regaining the strength there, um, this kind of full body, gentle strength has been great mentally and physically. I had a moment a few weeks ago that I've thought a lot about after because it is sort of like the theme of my book, but my normal instructor was, um, was, was out. And so I was with somebody I hadn't worked with before and I had seen her working with other students and she, she's Russian and she's like really tough. Oh dear. And she was kind of scary. Like I remember at one point we were doing a really challenging position and I was like, Oh, I hate this one. She's like, why? I was like, it's really uncomfortable. She's like, it's not supposed to be comfortable. But anyway, okay. at some point, like toward the end, she was like, no, you're, you're really strong. And I Aww. was like, and it, it was just like a kind of offhand thing, you know, like, you know, and it, but it, I was like, that is why these spaces can be so powerful. Yes. Like to have somebody just tell you that, you know, is when you're feeling overwhelmed or, you know, when you're unsure, you're recovered, it's like, it can be really meaningful. So yeah. Yeah. And I then think that's uh, important. Yeah. And, and you do talk about that a little bit towards the end of the book, you talk mm-hmm. about kind of the value of community. Yes. Um, And sharing exercise space and movement historically throughout mm-hmm. like existence is something yeah. that's kind of primal to us really absolutely yeah and there's all these ways in which we've, we've evolved that you know that we're rewarded for moving with other people uh when we move in sync you know we there's neurochemicals that are released that help us feel bonded and get a greater sense of hope and um so that's that's i mean and you can find that 
either in a class or even just, you know, uh, running, running a road race. So yeah. Um, I try to seek that those opportunities out too. But other than other than Pilates, I've been doing a little bit of running. I ran a 10k over the summer, and um, and a ton of walking because that's like in New York City, especially New York. That's what it's you do. New York, and it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And but my goal, you know, I definitely I miss running, and I I'm a um, I since I trained for the marathon, I've, I've done the Galloway method, which is run walking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, which, I mean, I now swear by, and it's been great at preventing injuries. So it, it also provides a gentle way to kind of ease back in. So that I'm hoping yep. that's my goal for the next year, really to, to get back into a running regular, a yeah. regular running routine, just because it makes me happy. Yeah. No, I, I, I feel like I got back after my first because you have one kid at that point, but mm -hmm. like with two, it does, it kind of, and I think we have a little bit more, I don't know, forgiveness for ourselves or a little more patience with ourselves where we don't feel like we're trying to prove anything Yeah, and we get back, you know, when it feels okay. I mean, I think mm -hmm. I probably started to run after our youngest, I don't, I honestly, I couldn't even tell you maybe a couple of years. And then mm -hmm. I think when she was three or four, I was running some, but it wasn't feeling good. And that's when I started doing CrossFit. I was like, Ooh, we're mm. going to have to mash this up, which, um, when you have two small children walking into a CrossFit gym is a little scary, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but, but now like, and what we know about load and, you know, now kind of staring down menopause and all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I started now. So any, any chance I get new moms, I'm like, Hey, so lifting a barbell is really good for a lot of reasons and your performance is going to get better yeah. with running. We're, we're getting a, a head on the, you know, the bone loss issue, all that stuff. So anybody with that, I'm like, okay, just be looking ahead community first, get around those mm -hmm. other moms, then mm -hmm. get back to the stuff you love. And then somewhere around the line, we're, we're, we're going to get under a barbell. <laughs> I, and it's so funny. I, I have been craving that. I've been wanting to lift heavy things that are mm. uh, I, other than my children. <laughs> it makes you feel pretty badass. I'll be honest yeah. with you. Like it feels pretty cool. Yeah. Um, right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky when I started, um, there's a, a gym literally between my office and our house. And mm. so I, I went there and, um, did a class that was a lot of moms after we dropped our kids off from school for a long time. So it was a very supportive community. The moms were freaking strong, like mm -hmm, super strong. Mm -hmm. Um, switch gyms. I go to a gym now at five 30 AM, but there's a couple other moms that were around the same mm -hmm. age and yeah, there's some 20 something sprinkled in, but I'm like, mm -mm, we're still getting at it, you know? And it just, mm -hmm. it just, it feels good to be done with it too. Like I'm totally. workouts already done. I can get yeah. on with my day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're yeah. You're really inspiring me. I, <laughs> and I, write all... it wasn't early though. Like yeah. it, it was when they were at school and you okay. know, they would sleep okay. and not get out of bed and I didn't have yes. to beat them and all that yes. stuff. So yeah, no, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, again, I always say like, I, you won't meet a truer believer in, in movement and in, yeah. in all of these things, which I write about regularly and I get to, you know, I have the, I'm so lucky I get to interview sort of the leading I experts know. about these things, you know? So it's just, yeah. I mean, I, it's, it is no easier for me, uh, despite everything I now know to find that time. Yeah, <laughs> you it know? is, it is. Yeah. So with, with all the people you got to talk to, mm -hmm. like what story kind of inspired you the most, if you could pick one? Oh my gosh. Well, uh, I, I, I mean, this sounds, this is cheesy, but I've really been inspired by almost every story that I've, that I've had the opportunity to report for. Well, I mean, I've written two profiles in the past year, um, that were so much fun to report and write. And one, one was about, uh, Martinez Evans, who's the founder of the, it's called the slow AF run club. I and love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I follow and, him on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. He's amazing. And I had, I had first interviewed him actually like a year before when I wrote about my own experience coming to terms with being a back of the pack runner. Yeah. And then he had a new book coming out. And so I got to, you know, I, I, there was, I knew there was so much more to his story. He just has such a, such a fascinating mm -hmm. story and is inspiring so many people. Um, you know, and he took what was, 
he he's a, a back of the packer and he had been running the New York City Marathon, I think 2018 and some jerk, you know, shouted out to him like, you're slow AF, buddy, go home. Mm-hmm. And they were, it was more uh, profane than that. And he was like, you know, I'm going to own that. And so the next right. time, next race, he showed up with a shirt that said slow AF with the turtle and like a movement was born. And so yeah. I loved writing that story. And for me as a back of the pack runner, so much of like what he stands for and what he wrote about in the book, which is fantastic, also called the uh, Slow AF Run Club, was already very familiar, you know, and the idea that like you just sort of, you could find joy in, in being a back of the packer. And, yep. um, but I do, I was so, I was so heartened by the response to his story. I, right. you know, I also like the New York times ran it on the front page on a Saturday, which that was super a, cool, by the way, congrats. Career, thank <laughs> you. Career first, never, you know, that like I, I, I was really blown away by that, but you know, I just think we're, this is not to go off on a tangent, but it's like life is really hard right now. And a lot, you know, the world mm-hmm. is really difficult right now. Um, just a little. Just a little. And so I have found that when I write in stories that are, you know, that are inspiring or that are about inclusivity and about self-acceptance, like they're, I do think people are hungry for those stories, you know, yeah. when they're genuine and it's not like, you know, just smile more. <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, so that it was, people really connected with his story and where they were like, I gave up running and this is, you know, I feel like I might try it again. And let's talk about community. I mean, just right. to know you're, you're not alone and however you move, I think is really, can be really, um, motivating and really powerful. Yeah. That's, a, I think a message that a lot of newer moms also resonate Mm. with because, Mm. you know, socially, you know, you're supposed to get back into your pre-pregnancy genes. You're supposed to be this happy, perky mom, you Mm -hmm. know, Lulu and and yoga and, and, you know, happy baby. And it's just not that that's just not real. And for running too, like I get so many moms that come in and apologize. That's the first thing out of their mouths. They're like, mm. I'm sorry, I'm not a runner. I, I lift, but I'm not a crossfitter. I'm like, please don't mm. apologize. The mm. fact that you want to move period, mm-hmm. like that's enough for me. Like, mm-hmm. please do not apologize. Like mm-hmm. we're wherever we are. Like I'm not very fast either. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's not how my genetics work out. Yeah. Unfortunately. So I, again, like I, I think there's so much value in finding other people that are like, Hey, I'm happy showing up and mm-hmm. The fact that I'm out there and again, that community is so incredibly important, especially from an isolating time when you're up at, mm-hmm. you know, oh, dark 30. I don't know how many times you got up last night to feed, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's sleeping through the night, but. Yay. But also our five-year-old has started coming into our bed. And Crap. so, yeah. <laughs> so it's, I don't know. Yeah. Sleep, no, sleep that's, is just. Uh... <laughs> it's, it's always something like that's, it's the same thing with our kids. They joke around it. Like if one is good, the other one's just a total jerk and uh, then they swap. <laughs> yeah. And then you get them to sleep. And now I'm like on this weird, like might be starting into menopause period. Mm. I don't know. Go to the mm-hmm. doctor today, figure that one out. Mm. And you wake up like 70 times a night mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for no good reason. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this, like, there's got to be a biological reason for this. And I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> I know. So it's something. Know. It's not it's fair. Always something. It's not fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so if we go back and look at kind of the stories from the book, like, mm-hmm. what do you think has impacted women the most? Um, for our generation, like what, what's gotten us to exercise, what's coming up for our sons and daughters? What do you Mm -hmm. think is, is, is kind of how we got there and then what's next for them? Yeah. I mean, so on one hand, I think, you know, we've, we've obviously benefited from, um, our generation, things like the passage of title nine and just this, uh, you know, I go into great detail in the book, but this huge cultural shift around women's bodies and what women are capable of um, yeah. from a physical and athletic standpoint. You know, I write in the book about how the there wasn't an Olympic marathon for women until 1984 because there were still fears about, you know, running, making your uterus fall out. And, um, and so, you know, that it, it is now 
women's sports, women's athletics are, are, well, there's still a long way to go, you know, they're pretty entrenched into our culture. Um, I also think, you know, partly thanks to social media, while social media is such a minefield on, you know, um, there has been this real, like, reckoning, questioning of all of these messages that we received growing up. I mean, I think maybe it's also partly my like social media community bubble that I've cultivated. But when you look back at there's, I, I follow a lot of people who kind of like um, call out messaging from, you know, teen and women's magazines and things yeah. that we thought were totally normal in the nineties, even like pop icons like Britney Spears, whose bodies are, you know, pop culture just felt free to like totally tear down and dissect. Yeah. And, and so there's more awareness about, you know, why we feel the way we do about our bodies. Um, but I think that the biggest shift is, and part of this has, it comes from us aging into ourselves and, but also the culture is a recognition that movement can be so great for mental health. Yeah. And I'm seeing yep. that even in um, the like exercise science, you know, there's mm -hmm. sort of this burgeoning field of, of uh, mental health exercise science, look, looking at exactly how it can benefit, you know, with things like recovering from trauma. And yep. um, I wrote about actually these trauma informed weightlifting programs last year. That was a really inspiring piece for me. Yeah. Um, and so I think for our kids, um, and I think, you know, it might be slightly different for depending on, you know, your gender, but um, I think, I just think there's so much more recognition that movement can be, um, it doesn't have to be, shouldn't be punitive and right. can just be, you know, a really great support for for our mental and emotional well-being. Yeah. And and so we need to prioritize it for that reason. And I mean, I still I'll just say like I still and this gets to um so I do think fitness and movement is actually still a privilege, you know. There's very much there, so. So much so. I mean, there's yep. huge issues with access and there are great organizations working to close those gaps, but um but, but I think recognizing, so I was going to say, I sometimes even feel like with doing Pilates, which I recognize as a, is a luxury for me and a privilege. And, um, I almost feel apologetic sometimes that, like that I'm carving out that time just to focus on yeah. myself and my body and my strength. Um, but I think that the more recognition that we're gaining as a culture that, uh, it's not just about like, it's not about like, oh, I'm working on my body to fit into my jeans or, you know, right. it, there are these much more profound gains to be had. We're moving toward a place where um, movement can be, you know, is more accessible to more people. Yeah. It, it, it needs to be a right, quite honestly. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think that's something I did not appreciate growing up. And a lot of things, I mean, over the years, you start to realize like, hey, this really is a privilege, but, you know, having a safe place to walk, having yeah. a safe place to go to a gym and not feel like you're going to be ogled or, totally. you know, feel like you, you feel like you're safe there. And mm -hmm. that I, I agree. We, we still have a, a long ways to go as far as, you know, having safe movement and safe spaces to move, mm -hmm. be a right and not a privilege. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. For you, for you being a, a boy mom right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. do you feel strongly about, or like, how do you feel as far as how you want to expose them to, um, you know, how other genders move because mm. you, you, I, I do notice that I've had more conversations with, with moms lately that, and it's interesting because they're feminist moms and they mm -hmm. have boys and they're like, oh, well, we're not going to do this because they're girls involved. We want them to do just boy stuff. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, that's kind of not the real world yeah. either. So, yeah, like, yeah, how, yeah. How, how, so it's uh, for you, like any thoughts? I know you got a you, you got a long time to think about this, but like how how to make sure that you know that they understand kind of this whole mm -hmm. uh, other gender side of things. Well, it's really funny. I think about. So there's this little, there's this program in our neighborhood called Kids in Sports. It's like a really popular program for just little kids, you know, mm -hmm. multi-sport. 
and I signed my older son up when he was maybe two or something. And, and I, I should say my husband is, is, is not a sports guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, he, he's from LA and he, he's a journalist as well. He writes okay. about one of the things he writes about his culture. And like, I always say like movies are his sport, you know? Uh, and so we, sh we, sh I signed my son up and we show up and I, I was feeling like, Oh my God, this feels so like stereotypical. I'm bringing my son to like a sports class, you know? Yep. And we show up and Jokes on me, he was the only boy in the class. Um, <laughs> so wow. a, after that, there was more, you know, like in, yeah. in subsequent sessions and stuff, it was it was more 50-50. But um, but I was like that, I was just laughing at myself that at my even my own assumptions that this right? would be a boy-dominated space. I mean, especially given everything I know. So, well, I guess in addition to just, you know we try to be very, um, you know, we're, we're not like, we're, we're trying not to enforce very strict gender norms in our house. And, um, but, um, but I think the biggest thing is just seeing me move, you know, and Absolutely. I am more like I, he has really, he's starting to have memories of me running races and especially because I run them with, you know, his grandpa. And so he's yeah. they've come out and cheered for me. And, um, that I think those memories, those are going to, I hope those will be some core memories. And, so, and actually the fact that I am more involved in that kind of, you know, in like athletics than his dad, yeah. um, I think that'll be a healthy, you know, like a, just a healthy paradigm, I think for him to yep. be growing up with and taking into his adult life. That's super cool. And I, I hear that from a lot of moms, um, even first time around new kid, they want to be an example. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, my oldest, not as we, we have a rule that you have to do some sort of movement related activity each quarter. Mm -hmm. And so he, he abides by that, but by no means is he my sporty guy where, whereas my daughter is a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And, um, but this was the first year I just did army 10 miler and Fortunately, my husband got the kids down to mm -hmm. be able to cheer and that sort of thing. And she ran with me for a little bit. Mm. And afterwards, she's like, can I do this with you next year? And I was like, I've never tried to push her. I was like, mm -hmm. that would be cool. Ten's a little long. Let's start with a 5K. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Baby steps. We don't need to blow you out at 10. Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's so amazing, That's though. No, yeah. but it's it's cool. It's cool to see. Um, and, and when I look back... Um, Oh, I just got emotional. I mm -hmm. was reading some of the stuff I had written down. Um, my parents were always at all of my sports stuff, mm -hmm. my cross country, and I was the slowest and God love them for <laughs> just like not being totally embarrassed. <laughs> um, at some point I realized I had some speed, which was good, but mm -hmm. I always would write and dad's going to be there. Yeah. Cause my mom was always there and for my dad mm -hmm. to be able to get off. And so, um, and he had one of those whistles that you could hear. So when you were swimming he, or like in the woods or anything, you mm -hmm. like your head just turns because you've been oh. trained since you were little. And right. so that for me, even now, like oh. that's very, yeah. My dad's had Parkinson's for over 20 mm. years. So um, mm. he, we can't do that stuff together yeah. anymore, but yeah. Um, to be able to have kind those of, memories. Yeah. 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 To be able to show that to the kids too is super cool. So yeah. It's amazing what you, Oh God, that comes. Whoa. <laughs> that's so <still> Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that's what we're trying to do for our kids is, is you know, exactly. in 30 years, they cry their faces off on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know. All well, right. I hope. <laughs> so everybody, we ask these questions at the end of every show. Um, mm -hmm. And you're probably reading or listening to a lot for research or whatnot, but like, what's the book you're reading or a podcast that you're listening to right now? Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. This, Cause there are so many. <laughs> so, I, know, I was going to say, you're going to have a list here. <laughs> I will. Um. Okay, so a podcast that had been recommended to me by a million people that I just discovered, I mean, I didn't, I just started listening to is Julia Louis Dreyfus's podcast. Ooh. I believe it's called Wiser Than Me. Okay. Um, and it's so awesome. It so partly why it was recommended to me was because her first ep episode was with Jane Fonda, who, mm, you know, I, okay, I read about in great depth in my book. And the so I think Julia Louis Dreyfus. I think she said she's around sixty, okay. and so. But the whole idea is that she. The premise is that like older women are 
these, I mean, obviously we know this, but are these great sources of wisdom and our culture doesn't always treat them that way. And so she wants to bring on women who are older than her, you know, by 10 to, you know, however many, 10, 20 years and kind of like hear their life lessons. And so she had, she talked to, yeah. Um, Jane Fonda and Ruth Reichel, the the food critic, yes. um, and, and Isabel Allende, and just and she's just I hadn't she's amazing. Like I really I'm just so enjoying these conversations. That's um, awesome. Yeah, that's sort of like my taking a break from the world and <laughs> the news and, and everything. You, you need that right now. I think we all yeah. need a little bit of a, a break from levity. The world right now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, All right. Next one. Um, favorite yeah. activity since becoming a mom. Oh, and it doesn't have to do with your kids if you don't want it to. You know, I mean, it's when you asked that, it was like I was immediately. I did think about the kid-focused activities that I do that I didn't do before coming becoming a mom. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, and I mean, this might be. I don't know. I don't know if this is unusual or not, but like. I I actually love I love taking my son, my older son to all of the birthday parties. I mean, I just I know that it's like probably you haven't gone to Chuck E. Cheese, have you? I wish. I wish no, I had no I had no. like half of my birthday parties growing up at Chuck E. Cheese. So the, yeah, we yeah. anyway, I grew up in Atlanta, I should say. So okay. it was a very suburban childhood. But um I mean, sometimes they're hellish. Don't get me wrong. There and and sometimes my son also like refuses to participate. And I've had moments where I've I've had some comically bad moments at birthday parties. But um, there is just I found like that's how I've gotten to know the parents. And like you yeah. end up seeing each other every weekend, and it's really yep. nice. And I don't know. It's just it, it's been a you know, especially when you have kids just to have like an activity. It's yes. been, it's been, I've, I've enjoyed reconnecting with my inner child through these birthday parties. That's so, so cool. Well, um, that's going to switch to be sports eventually mm, because there's not as many birthdays. Yes, um, yes. Then the problem becomes you like the parents, but the kids don't like each other anymore and they're not right, friends. But you right. want to still be friends with the parents? <laughs> right. I know. I know. I'm, yeah. Yeah. There's the foreshadowing for you. you. You got time to work it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, I know. Need That's to live super in the fun moment. though. Yeah, I yeah, mean, totally live in the moment. Don't necessarily eat the cake every weekend or the pizza. That that's you know I'm just, yeah, I'm getting the, I finally <laughs> I finally got to that place. It is that yeah. part is challenging, but yeah. Um I know, and I feel like I probably just lost a lot of listeners with that, but don't get me wrong, there's tons of stuff I do for myself and you know, and my no, but work that but yeah. It's nice to be around other people and you know, experience your kid having fun and meet some nice parents. But don't eat the cake. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> All right. One piece of advice for new moms. Be kind to yourself. I mean, I, you know, I'll pass along something that I, I remember from my, my baby shower before my first son was born that, um, was like the resounding piece of advice given to me, which was that it's all a phase. And, yeah. you know, especially now that I'm in it with my second, um, I just like with my first son, everything, everything felt so amplified, you know? Yes. And I, I was, I was still, I was kind of like with that pregnancy, the first pregnancy, I was so worried about like following the rules and, you know, with sleep yeah. and solids and milestones yes. and like, and now I, I, you know, and I know this is like, classic second third child thing but yep. like I've just we're so much more relaxed and it's like he'll figure it out it's also like my old I see that you know the <laughs> my older son was this amazing sleeper and now you know like I said he comes into our bed every night it's like you can do everything by the book and still ultimately yes. it's not really fully in your control. Yes. And, and I, so, I, yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's like the biggest karma lesson for those of us that controlled things for our entire lives. It's yeah. like, actually control this. Oh, wait, yeah. you can't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. It's all a phase and just be kind to yourself as you're, as you're riding these waves, <laughs> they yes. will pass. I, I totally agree. All right. Last one. And what does it mean to you to be an active mom in postpartum? Yeah, it means, um, I mean, practically speaking, it means 
doing a ton of walking, always wearing comfortable shoes. <laughs> and I'm like, I, anytime we have an outing, I'm wearing basically athleisure. Um, uh, reconnecting with a feeling of strength and just feeling, you know, uh, I'm really grateful for the ways that I'm able to be active in caring for my children, um, you know, lifting them, being on the floor with them. And, and uh, so it also means seeking out ways so that you feel strong enough and good enough and injury free enough to be able to um, actively parent if that's yeah. something you, you want to do. Yeah. And, and that's going to, I always tell people, I'm like, look, it's going to get more active. You're not going to realize <laughs> it, but especially once they start doing practices and you, you know, all yeah. that stuff, it, it, it it, it levels up. Yeah. You, <laughs> levels yeah. Up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Built in, built in workouts. Yeah. Yes. No, la last week, I think we were, we were emailing and I was on a field trip with 72 yes. fifth graders. It was supposed to be overnight camping. It was 28 degrees. So we slept in a animal lab with snakes and I slept next to a box turtle. That's my first time <laughs> on the floor. And so sleeping on the floor and then the middle of the night had to take fifth graders out to go to the bathroom. So you're like walking oh over like gosh. bodies and then carting stuff. And so I'm like, that's what you're training for is so <laughs> you don't right. have to get up and pee yourself in the middle of the night 70 times yeah. and it doesn't kill you to sleep on the floor with a box turtle. <laughs> so. oh I'm, I'm impressed that you slept at all. So <laughs> I am too. I went in with really low expectations. Yeah. I think that's the key is like, oh, it wasn't so bad after all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So if you don't want to read about box turtles, but you do want to read about um, fitness and um, the history of how women explored exercise, you're gonna want to catch this book. I know we had Christine Yu on earlier this year. This, I think you want to read this one first. Um, so it's let's, let's get physical, how women discovered exercise and reshape the world. And Danya, you've been such a huge advocate for speaking to women's stories and getting some of our information for postpartum um, out there. And I just want to thank you so much for using your megaphone um, to get good vetted information out um, and just keep doing it. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do as well. I appreciate you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Did you enjoy the podcast? If so, leave us a five-star review on iTunes and tell a friend to do the same. Are you a postpartum mom or postpartum pro wanting to know more about getting back to running after baby? check out all my free goodies on carriepagliano.com. This podcast represents the opinions of Dr. Carrie Pagliano and her guests to the show. The content should not be taken as medical advice and is for entertainment purposes only. Always consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.